in legal philosophy, it's partly, you know, one part of it is that when I teach my students, their law students, these are people who are going to be out there in the world. This is what they're going to do for a living. And, and legal philosophy helps them make their life a reflective life. Is, you know, what am I doing? What's my place within the legal system? What's, my, what's the place of law within society, within justice and morality? And think about the value of, of law and the value of their place within law. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Brian Bix. He is Frederick W. Thomas Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Minnesota, and his work is focused on legal philosophy, contract law, family law, and the philosophy of language and how that relates to these other issues. His books include, among others, Jurisprudence, Theory and Context, uh, Law, Language, and Legal Determinacy, Contract Law, Rules, Theory, and Context, and uh, the Oxford Introduction to U.S. Law, Family Law, said there's some others as well. He also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Bix. And thank you, and don't forget the Dictionary of Legal Theory, where I hope to get a second edition out at some point. Was, Very good point. <laughs> happy to hear suggestions. Yeah, awesome. So I read a few of your um, papers in preparation to give me some thoughts on questions. And um, the one I wanted to talk about first is um, one on uh, originalism. Um, I think that's somewhat synonymous with intentionalism, I think. I don't know, because I, I talked a few months ago with Stanley Fish, um, whose view is he calls intentionalism. Um, and and, and, that, intention, yeah. Intentionalism is sort of the general principle. Um, originalism uh, usually refers specifically to constitutional interpretation. Uh, okay, right. Oh, right. Okay. So if we're talking about just textual or legal interpretation generally, um, that view we would call like intentionalism um, that says, roughly speaking, the, way to, the right way to interpret the text or statute or whatever involves like figuring out what the original author or authors intended to convey something like that yeah and if you're talking about originalism that's like that applied specifically to like the u.s constitution or maybe constitutions generally that's the idea yes that's correct and um if you you, you talk to stanley fish or if you read lawrence solom or things like that you'll know there's a lot of varieties of originalism and there's intended application there's uh original the understanding the original understanding of meaning there's uh intentions regarding interpretation there's there's it, it comes now in a variety of flavors as it were yeah yeah so i guess um to begin like what what are some of those options and like how might you approach this issue especially thinking about how um especially in legal matters and maybe constitutional matters, there's not this sharp divide between um, like meaning and practice or application, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I should start off with a, with a caveat. This is, uh, there, there are many, many people who are much more involved in this topic and written a lot more than this than I have, but I'm happy to say a few words. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there's a lot of complications and permutations. So originalism when it first became important and influential it was the original application intentions of the of the framers so you know did the people who wrote the 14th amendment think that um it would foreclose uh, sec uh racially segregated schools or what would they have thought about affirmative action um and there were a lot of problems with that, not least of which is that there's not a lot of evidence. Um, 
and uh, uh, what evidence there is is uh, is conflicted and ambiguous and subject to manipulation and interpretation. Um, another problem being that whether you're talking about the framers of the original constitution or the framers of particular amendments, there's quite a few of them. And how do you A, locate B, add up their intentions? And C, the question was why we should be bound um, by the application intentions of the authors, especially since in some ways, what made it the law was not the people who drafted it, but the people who ratified it. So more recent um, and more influential forms of originalism right now focus on how the terms used would have been understood by the audience at the time, at least the legally informed audience. So what, you know, the right to bear arms, how would that have been understood? Equal protection of the laws, cruel and unusual punishment, how would that have been understood by the people uh, who ratified, who voted for the, in the legislatures, the lawyers for whom it was uh, uh, written to be applied? How would they understand the terms? Um, there are still issues. There are still many people who think this is, is far too subject to manipulation. Um, the other sort of complication the other major complication is if you write a document, if you write a constitution that says we're going to protect equal protection, we're going to protect due process of law, we're going to protect dignity, or not in our constitution, but many other constitutions, we're going to protect freedom of expression. The, the mere use of very general language like that is often understood as a delegation to the judges at whatever time it's being applied um, to use their best understanding of what equality means, even if it's a different understanding than those who um, drafted the document 100 or 200 years ago may have understood. Um, and, and so the, the line between original intention or original understanding on one hand, and what we call a living constitution or a living tree constitution, as they call it in Canada, on the other can become a little bit thin. Um, if you understand the use of a, of a general term like equality or cruel and unusual punishment or due process of the law as basically a delegation to the judges at some later point to use their best understanding of what the term means. Yeah, that's that's very good. So that, there's two two things that I wanted to bring up. One is, I guess, and this is just maybe to do with the thing that you just said, um, but maybe a more general point, which is that oftentimes um when a constitution or some other legal text or something else is produced there's there's some vagueness in it right it's not it's not developed in a precise way to, such that it covers like any possible case and you could imagine or it might be the case that later um judges or otherwise legal officials are making more precise as they see fit, um, like previously developed laws or statutes. Um, like that, that might be a way not of interpreting the previous um, doctor, uh, like constitution or whatever, but a way of developing a more precise law, maybe built on that in a way. Does that make sense? Or what would you think about that as a description of what's going on sometimes? So, any text, um, whether it's a contract, a, a trust document, a statute, a constitutional provision, will have um, some vagueness or uncertainty in its application, especially as new facts pop up and new circumstances arise. And H.L.A. Hart, the, the legal theorist, famously said, this is inevitable. It's called the open texture of language, the open texture of law, the open texture of rules. Uh, and, and additionally, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to, to um, delegate or you know, effectively delegate a certain amount of lawmaking, filling in of, of the gaps uh, uh, to, to later judges to develop the laws in one way or another. I mean, to some extent, much of our law was developed this way in, in the common law. Uh, we're not even interpreting a particular statute. You're sort of developing um, general principles uh, as you know, as they apply to new cases, um, there's obviously a lot of controversy about this. Uh, Ronald Dworkin argued that there are, there isn't uncertainty. There actually are right answers 
to be found, even if you can't demonstrate them. Uh, some of the American legal realists and some of the critical legal studies theorists said, no, actually, there's a lot less certainty than HLA Hart claimed. Um, so the extent of legal determinacy is a matter of ongoing discussion. Yeah, yeah I guess I guess one thing I had in mind, well, one, actually, that's something you cover in one of your books, right? Um, I, I cover it a at number least one of places. Of <laughs> my, 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 my doctoral dissertation was made into a book called Law, Language, and Legal Determinacy. So yeah, it's something I've, I've written about before. Yeah, um, I guess in terms of thinking about it, um, in terms of deference, right? Uh, so like um, you said something about how what we intend when we say it, we have these sort of norms built in and, and we're leaving it open to future theorizers or legal officials to um, decide the appropriate laws given those goals like equity and so on. So um, I, I, I had a, uh, uh, a supervisor for a while named Tony Honore mm -hmm. and, and he explained it. He said, look, if I tell you go to the store and get, you know, and buy me this newspaper, right? That, that's that's a, 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 a direct request without a lot of discretion. Um, but if I say go to the store and buy me a good newspaper, to some extent, I'm deferring to you the choice of what counts as a good newspaper. Now, you may come back with a broadsheet, you know, with a with a, a tabloid that I think is a, a bad choice, and I say you got it wrong. But amongst the, you know, what they call the quality newspapers, the broadsheets, you know, probably they're all equally right. So, you know, part of it's in, you know, that, that's one of the things in, in one of my articles, which is you know, what, what's the level of delegation? What's, what's the level of, of trust, right? Um, and if I, if I say, you know, set a reasonable rate, that's all generally understood, you know, when, a, when Congress says to the agency, set a reasonable rate, that's generally understood as a delegation of the agency to use its expertise as best it can and, and make the judgment itself as to what counts as a reasonable rate. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good example. I guess the, the one, like there's a there's a distinction, as I see it, between um, like sort of semantic deference and the sort of instructions, like um, or recommendations for later theorizers or you know legal officials on what um, laws to develop or um, something like that. So like, is a question of whether the initial author or authors of or ratifiers or whatever of some legal document um, are saying part of what I mean by um, these um, these statements or the way they should be correctly interpreted is just based on, I don't know, how later um, legal officials or theorizers come to understand these things or something like that. Or are they saying, okay, here's my law or whatever that I've developed here and um, I'm recommending or instructing later people to use this uh, as they see fit, um, but not necessarily as an interpretation of what I meant. Does that distinction make sense? Or I, I'm not sure I'm entirely following it. So if I tell you set a reasonable rate, or I tell mm -hmm. you make sure there's due process of law, right? Um, the general understanding is, you know you should use your best efforts to figure out what that requires, not figure out, you know, you know, if I say, you know, uh, equal protection on racial matters, and I have one view as to what that means about affirmative action, and you have a different view. The question is not, do you need to read my mind or look at my notes to see what I think about affirmative action, but whether you should use your own best judgment or the best judgment of the experts of the field as to, you know, what equal treatment of the races means for affirmative action. Um, you know, when, when Congress writes statutes, often they'll have legislative histories and they'll, they'll you know, go into some detail as to what they think, how this should be applied. And, and then the question is, um, should judges look at that legislative history? Justice Scalia famously said no, um, that they shouldn't look at the legislative history because it's not part of what was enacted. Um, you know, it was not part of the law. It didn't go through all the proper channels. 
and that it's not uh, uh, something that citizens generally have access to. I mean, it's, it's less true now than it was then. You probably can find anything on the internet. But um, Scalia thought that, that as a matter of a rule of law, you, you know, what's enacted in law is what should guide the judges and, and not um, detailed reports written up by their staff. Additionally, Scalia was worried that there was so much legislative history that a judge could find whatever the judge wanted. The judge wanted to come out one way, they could find evidence for that. Wanted to come out the other way, he could find evidence for that. And, and, and Scalia, both in his support for originalism and his opposition to the use of legislative history said, we want to constrain judges from the temptation of coming out the way they want to come out. Yeah. Yeah, so in the case where um, it's like it says either explicitly or not, like, that sort of instruction, um, like, um, or that sort of deference where it's like use jurisprudence or um, uh, find the most equitable uh, um, solution to the some problem or whatever. Um, that's like, I would understand that is just that, like a sort of instruction where the outcome of that, like suppose we decide that, okay, this, this is what we should do to um, have the most equitable, whatever, um, law. And that solution though, isn't what the person meant, right? That's just, that's just like what we did on the basis of their instruction, if that makes sense. Well, so then there's a lot of weight on what they meant. So, I mean, one thing Ronald Dworkin and others have pointed out is we have lots of intentions, right? I may, have intentions or at least ideas regarding what equal protection means in the context of affirmative action. I may also have ideas about who should be making the decision. I should I may also have ideas about how, whether people should be deferring to my intentions, right? We can have different levels and layers and types of intention. So it is and is not what I meant, right? If, my, if I'm delegating to you the fact that, that if it was left to me, I'd apply it one way. It doesn't mean that you need to apply it the same way. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it's going to turn on maybe um, what facts or things will count as part of what I meant and not. Right, like you're putting um, a lot of weight on the yeah. phrase "what I meant." Now, True. I know um, Stanley Fish and to some extent Larry mm -hmm. Alexander say what I meant always means intentions, but that doesn't get us very far because as we were just talking about, there are levels and types of intention and those levels and types of intention can be in conflict. And so you have to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I guess that's a good point. And that's something I was also thinking about when it came to, um, certain views of like uh, certain intentionalist originalist views um, is that it might wrongly construe meaning as something entirely determined um, uh, by the individual rather than meaning being the sort of public phenomena. Um, is that something you think about or? Um... Well, yeah, I mean, that that to some extent is the, the you know, tracks the difference between the former version of intentionalism, which is original, you know, a former version of originalism, original intention, right? I, application, I, I think that it should or should not apply to affirmative action. But now we've moved to um, the general understanding is how was this, how would this have been understood by the reasonable person or reasonable legislator or reasonable lawyer at the time it was enacted? And so we're now moving back to public meaning, right? It's not what did they write in their diary? It's how would, you know, what would the law dictionary or its equivalent at the time have defined it? Yeah. Yeah, more, more broadly though, like I was thinking, like suppose it turned out that the right way to interpret um, the document or text is something like um, what a originalist or maybe a new originalist would say. Um, it seems to be a, a second question whether that's the thing that's like relevant to like current legal practice. Is that I mean we might care about um, more about 
um i don't know some other there, facts about, yeah there's an idea amongst originalists where and it's not only amongst the originalists it actually has a bit of a history but they distinguish um interpretation and construction and interpretation is more what do the terms mean however it is we want to approach meaning but construction says well to go from the meaning to the law might involve some additional work like it might involve taking into account legal precedent in the area how has the court decided you know we don't you know the, how originalists deal with precedent is a complicated topic on its own, but taking into account precedent, taking into account maybe, you know, the argument that that if we we're stuck with the original meaning or the original understanding, it'll create an absurd outcome here. And so there are that's known as construction rather than interpretation. And so there are so someone like Larry Solon would say what originalism requires us is that you start with meaning. You may not end with meaning. You, you, there may be aspects of, of legal construction you need to do to figure out what the, how to resolve a particular case. Um, but you, but you're, you're, you start with the, the original understanding. Right. Yeah. And more on that, like, um, you sort of already touched on this, but in that article, you, you make this point that especially when in um, uh, legal analysis where there's like norms involved, there's not, there's often this less sharp boundary between what it means and um, certain practices or the like application of, of these um, norms and so on. Um, yeah, the, the, the point I was trying to make back then was was twofold. One of them, I think, is the relatively straightforward idea that sometimes the fact that a, a, a word is used in the context of a norm, of a, of a prescription or prohibition or an authorization, will itself affect the meaning. It's not just, you know, meaning plus normative. It's not like this sort of Austinian notion of, of meaning plus uh, uh force equals equals content so in the example and i'm borrowing this from from tony honore again is if i say you know no cars in the park right um you know no doesn't mean no and never doesn't always mean never it, it may just mean you know there's a strong presumption against you know lawn fuller's example of you can have a statement, a rule that says no vehicles in the park, but no one would apply that to a, a car that was part of a war memorial, right? Or they probably wouldn't apply it to an emergency vehicle coming to save someone who had a, a problem in the, an accident in the park, right? Never doesn't mean never in a normative context. It means almost never. I mean, there was a, a, a Justice Black who, who used to famously argue that that when the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, you know, infringing on the freedom of expression, no means no, um, and no, and the only no that that applies now is that no one follows Justice Black. Everyone says that you know no law means well, you know, depends on the law, depends on the infringement, and there's a strong presumption. So that was one point I was making the article. The other point I was making the article was that it's often there's sort of a thin or blurry line between pure semantic meaning or pra even pragmatic meaning and application and that that the process of application may affect or clarify or or, or make more precise um the, the meaning of the term in this context yeah yeah i think that too i mean like what do you and think that, of that? That builds on some ideas from Hans Georg Gadamer, but I, I really haven't gotten back to that. So, um, uh, you know, if you have suggestions, how how to develop it further? But th that's that's a topic I I sort of ne never got back to. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think kind of broadly, like language is this. It's kind of messy, right? Like, um, and it evolves um, all the time, and so like even even the same person at different times using the same word and ostensibly the same concept might apply it slightly differently. Um, 
and so and you might think of that as oh um they're like developing their concept maybe they're using a different concept um well you know, just, when i when i yeah. can you know many people are pointing out if i'm conversing with you um our main purpose is to try to figure out precisely what each one another is trying to say and communicate and the fact that we may speak imprecisely or even erroneously doesn't matter but if i'm speaking you know as a lawmaker um in a rule that will be applied to a large number of people into the indefinite future different sets of standards necessarily apply and different expectations and you know, there's a very large literature. Do you do you follow Dworkin and say we should, you know, interpret this in light of all the other acts of legal officials and make it the best it can be? Or do you follow Stanley Fish and Larry Alexander and say, well, we're, we're here to figure out the intentions of the lawmakers. And, the, and if it's a, a group lawmakers, a majority, you know, and if there is no uh, uh, majority intention, then there's no law. Um, or is it something in between? Yeah, yes. Yeah, difficult questions. I mean, I guess, like, for me, I would step back and think, like, which sort of things do I care about in terms of um, developing or enacting or um, enforcing various uh, laws and other legal statutes? It's like, well, there, there, there are two strong, there are two equally strong and important values going on. On one hand, um, we live in a democracy, or even if we didn't live in a democracy, there are people who are assigned the right to make decisions on our behalf. So they have the authority and we should figure out what authoritative choices they have made. On the other hand, we also believe that we live in a rule of law sort of world where you shouldn't be held to something beyond what you have some basis to know about. So if the lawmakers by saying no cows meant no horses, but no one can understand that. Um, you know, there's good rule of law reasons to say if they said no horses, then no horses should be what should be applied. Even if privately in their, their diaries, they all said by horses, we mean cows. Um, so there's rule of law on one hand, and there's the importance of the authoritative decision-making on the other, and these two can come into conflict as Justice Scalia liked to emphasize. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess so someone might have this um, response on the Constitution stuff, which is that, like, okay, we might ask and potentially answer a variety of potentially interesting um, questions about what the um, authors originally intended, how was it originally received, and so on. Um, and but it's like a next question of like, okay, what are we gonna do with that? Are we gonna use the way we understand that according to one of those interpretations is like deciding the law now? Are we gonna um, like let the law now be decided primarily just by um, how the um, discourse has devolved, evolved since then? Or like, I mean, that seems to be an open question of how we want to continue to, um, Discourse. Somewhere in the background is always the question of why should really important questions be determined by some scribblings of unrepresentative men, and they were all men, writing 200 years ago. And so many people who argue for a living constitution or a living tree constitution say, you know, part of the reason why it's legitimate to be bound by it is that we're not going to be, their argument is, we're not going to be entirely bound by every preference um, and intention of, of those people, but we will use the best of it, use the general principles of it, and apply them in a better way, or at least in our best current way. Um, but you know, one wants to do that without saying, and therefore, whatever whatever the current unelected judges want to do is fine with us. So something in between, right? Some yeah. amount of loyalty and uh, of what came before, without being, you know, entirely bound by the dead hand of unrepresentative slaveholding white males of two hundred plus years ago. Yeah, 
yeah i mean this this might be a fairly trivial point but on one hand you you want um it seems like we want some stability in the law and it's, and and so on but also it should be able to change to changing populations changing circumstances changing goals and values um and like us changing theorizing as well um so like yeah as you say maybe something something in the middle um is ideal but figuring that out is is a difficult question well these, these all of the all the stuff you've been asking about and we've been talking about are really really big big questions of which there are I have shelves and shelves of books on the topic. So, I mean, it's, you know, we're not going to, not something can be resolved uh, in, in a brief conversation. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, all right. I did want to turn to another paper, although you have another um, chapter coming out on this issue, which is um, on the possibility of like global error um, and, and legal truth. So the thought, uh might be that okay if law is primarily a matter of convention we might argue that sort of widespread and pervasive error about the legal facts um especially by those who like decide those conventions that's incoherent it doesn't make sense to say that they could be um confused because they kind of decide what the facts are by their conventions um so in, this, this is yeah yeah so the the question was you know can everyone can everyone be wrong on some legal issue. And on one hand, there's a sense in which law is like language, right? If everyone uses the word sentimental now as sort of a pejorative term, even though it was used as a kind of praiseworthy term 150 years ago, if everyone now uses it in a negative way, um, that's what it means. Language just is what everyone says it is. Um, and there's a conventional side to law. Um, and so there's something paradoxical to claiming that, that everyone could be wrong about some question of, of the constitution or the common law or whatnot. On the other hand, law along with being conventional also has authorities. It has authoritative texts, it has authoritative people. And so you could have a situation where, you know, for 100, for 200 years or 150 years, um, people said that the, you know, 14th Amendment didn't have much to say about, uh, about marriage, or at, at most it had said, you know, um, you can prevent interracial marriage. But then suddenly, at some later point, there's a claim, well, actually, it means something no one else ever thought it meant, which is that you couldn't exclude same-sex couples from marriage. Now, I'm not here to make the argument that that decision was right or wrong, but it, you know, and, and, and over Justice Scalia, the him again, um, vehement argument, how could all of these people in all of these courts be wrong for all of this time, you know, the fact is that the you know the court has changed its mind on the First Amendment, it's changed its mind on the Second Amendment on guns, it's changed its mind on the 14th Amendment, it's changed its mind on the 11th Amendment on sovereign immunity. And it is sensible. It's not always right, but it is something you can say with sense. It's not nonsensical to say that we have an understanding of this aspect of the Constitution that is new, that everyone up to now for 170 or 200 or 220 years um, had a different view of because it's a, because it's an authoritative document and because what counts as correct can be based either of, hey, we just discovered something new in, in, in Madison's diaries, you know, one of the, the framers, or hey, we now have an understanding of equality we didn't have before because we are it's a delegated to each generation to have their best understanding of equality it's not entirely nonsensical to say that everyone was wrong before and we've got it right. It may be unlikely, there may be a strong presumption against it, but it's not entirely nonsensical. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and there was another case that you discussed, which is that um, when the legal statute or, or whatever, like borrows a term um, from outside the sort of legal conventions, yeah, um, if, right. if, if it says, you know, no cruel and unusual punishment, maybe our, 
understanding of cruel and unusual punishment has changed because we have a better understanding of that. Or, you know, if it makes makes reference to a, a, a mathematical concept or a uh, an anthropological concept, you know, that we we could all have been wrong about that, and we now have a different view of it. Yeah, I was I was wondering about um, in the case where um, you have some authoritative text and then a bunch of rulings that rule a certain way, um, say regarding um, gay marriage, um, for example. And then later someone says, oh, I think the right way to interpret the original text or whatever the right law that we should have is that uh, gay marriage should be legal. Now, um, insofar as the people involved in those previous rulings were trying to interpret that text, that, that they might've been wrong about that. Um, but all the same, like they might've actually made, when they made their rulings that those became part of the conventions, the legal conventions. So it's like, I mean, it, 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 I'm thinking like it's possible that um, both that they're wrong about what the original text was saying and that the conventions they developed were really conventions. That's just part of what the legal facts were at the time. There, there, there's a comp. I, I've, I've written quite a bit about this recently. There, when we talk about truth and law, it can get complicated, partly for the reasons you're talking about, which is truth is partly a matter of reason and partly a matter of fiat, right? It's um, so there's a constitutional document, right, and and um, Let's go back to an older case, a notorious case, one of the most notorious cases, Plessy versus Ferguson, that interpreted the 14th Amendment to say, well, it seems to say racial equality, but separate but equal is good enough, right? Separate as long as you can, you can separate the races as long as they're treated equally, that's consistent with the 14th Amendment. Now, everyone today says that it was a, not only wrong, but a horrible decision, whatever. But the fact is, it was, it was the law of the land for decades, right? So you can imagine a time right after Plessy versus Ferguson was decided. And someone could say, you know, what is the law of, what is the law in the United States about racial segregation? And people would say, well, on one hand, we think the, the best understanding of the 14th Amendment, and I can show you all the legislative history, and I can show you the proper understanding of equality. I think it means that you can't have racial segregation. But the other side says, but hey, there was just a decision by the US Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, saying racial segregation is OK. Well, what are we going to do about that? Right. Well, you know, you could say, well, maybe they'll come to their senses and, and, and change their mind and overrule it. And, and there are cases where the U.S. Supreme Court has changed its mind pretty quickly. You know, one of them on the flag salute cases of the 1940s. Um, but Plessy versus Ferguson, it took them decades. Right. So imagine either right after the decision comes out or a decade or two decades after it comes out, you would say you might say racial, you know, racial segregation is constitutionally forbidden, that statement is both true and false, right? Because it's, it, it, it's, it, it's um, constitutionally forbidden because that's the, the really the best understanding of what the Constitution means. On the other hand, the highest court in the land for whom there's no further appeal has you know, said otherwise and has stuck to it, right? So there's, there, are, there are times when you know, X is the law can be both true and false because the, the source from authority and the source from fiat conflict. Yeah, so I guess, would we want, want to say that in that case, there's, there's two different, at least two different senses of the law. Um, so it's, it's, with respect to one of them, it's like, it is legal in that sense is like- If you want to yeah. say there are two different senses of the law, if you want to say there are two different senses of true, that's fine, but the fact mm. is that, that you know, we have uh, a paradox. And yeah, you know, I, there, 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 there are decisions about the parts of the 14th Amendment and parts of the 11th Amendment where people are still arguing the court has got it wrong. And it was, you know, came up before the court 
Someone actually made the argument before the Supreme Court not that long ago. And one of the justices said, hey, you know, we've been, you know, you might be right, but we've been saying it the other way for 135 years and you better, you know, give us a, 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 an even, you know, even clearer, stronger argument that you have for us to change our minds after 135 years. Um, so, you know, but it's still open. It, it, it's, it's, it's not a nonsensical argument to make. Now, if you were if you were advising your client, or if you were arguing in the district court, you wouldn't say that, right? Because they don't have the power. You know, the lower courts don't have the power to do anything about it. Um, so, if you were advising your court, well, the, what the Supreme Court has said for 135 years is wrong, and I'm going to tell that to the district court. Well, that's stupid. You're going to lose. You're doing malpractice. On the other hand, if you appeal the case and you get up to the Supreme Court. It's not a non, you know, it, it may still be an argument I wouldn't want to bet money on, but it's no longer a nonsensical argument to tell the court the position you have taken for 125 years or whatever it is, is wrong. The true understanding of this provision of the 14th Amendment um, is different and, and you should revisit it and you should overturn 125 years of precedent. It, again, it's, it's, it's not a, it's an uphill battle, but it's not a nonsensical argument. And it's not necessarily legal malpractice. Yeah, that definitely makes that definitely makes sense to me. I guess what I was just worried to um, that I wanted to avoid was like when we say that something is both the law and not the law. I want to avoid it being like a true contradiction or something. Like that. I don't want that. Um, but well, maybe I'm, I don't. I'm, 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 I, I know you know people like their excluded middle, but I, I think. <laughs> Um, you know, when 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 a court comes down with a decision before, especially a lower um, uh, an intermediate court comes down with a decision, I think to say that it is and it is not the law um, is a reasonable thing to say in the circumstances. And and I apologize for the contradiction. Yeah, fair enough. I, I guess yeah, I would probably I would probably want to um, clarify that there's maybe two different senses of the law at play here, but. Um, if the right but, way to go is but to when you it. say there are two different senses of the law, they cash out the same way, right? The law, you know, if you you say, you know, look, the, the intermediate appellate court just came down with a decision that I think is clearly wrong. I don't know if it's going to be reversed, right? I don't know if it's going to be reversed by an en banc decision of the same court or by the Supreme Court. It might or it might not, right? So my client comes to me and says, "What's the law? Can I do this or can I not do it?" Well, yes and no. Right. I, I, the, you, to tell the person, well, there's a sense of the law that you can do it and a sense of the law that you can't, you're not helping your client. The client wants to know, you know, will I be liable or will I not be liable? And both senses of the word law in, in your phrase, you know, either either help with that statement or it doesn't. And and so I think, you know, I don't think you've avoided the contradiction because the, the bottom line cash out value is what will the court do when you know when i when i act contrary to what the immediate appellate court had advised and i don't know uh i mean in the interim suppose they're like i'm um, gonna potentially change the um the law at that level um because they recognize some misinterpretation of some authoritative text like the constitution um what you care about i guess at least prior to the change is what the court says at that level, because um, that's what you might be held accountable to and so on. Um, and if they've changed it to reflect that what they take to be the correct interpretation of the text, then um, you know what you would care about is what they've changed it to, I guess. Um, if that makes sense. Maybe I'm missing something. So when Congress changes the law, it's almost always perspective. When the Supreme Court overrules an earlier decision, it's a little more complicated. Sometimes it'll, they'll apply it retrospectively, especially to if it will help like someone get out of jail, um, uh, uh, the criminals, if they loosen up the interpretation of, a, of some criminal statute. But if, if a case is, you know, the, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals comes out with a decision, and then the U.S., you know, and either the M M a circuit en banc or the U.S. Supreme Court reverses. It's not a question of retrospective or prospective. It's it's simply, you know, changed, right? Um, and you know, good luck to your client. 
Uh, look, the law, one of the things people learn in law school is the law is often unsettled. And um, uh, uh, people who, who like to have you know, clear that the law is X or not X, and it's always one or the other, well, not always. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I definitely agree with that, that um, it's, it's often unsettled and um, but that's so like you part have, of the you procedure. You have to be a right? Dworkinian to believe in, in the pure law of an excluded metal, because Dworkin would say, you know, the law on, you know, affirmative action is constitutionally protected or affirmative action is constitutionally prohibited, whatever, you know, to say that that is true before the Supreme Court makes a decision, right? Um, you have to believe that there is a right answer out there to be found for every dispute. And, 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 and Dworkin famously believed that, but he was very much, you know, there are very few people with him. Um, most people believe that there are some level of hard cases where the, you know, the truth, the truth value of a, of a legal proposition uh, is, is not clear until the Supreme Court decides. And even then, the Supreme Court may change its mind. So, I mean, tr truth and law is, is a different sort of animal. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely sympathetic to that that view that um, because of the sort of vagueness in what's covered by, um, or not just what's covered by, but but what the um, legal fact would be, um, combined with the fact that courts can get it wrong. Yeah, I guess that as well. But even if you just had the vagueness where some some statute yeah. or something. Well, once once you're doing vagueness, yeah. then yes, now we got to talk about, you know, even outside of law, what's the what's the truth value of vague statements? And, and right. that's that's a different set of conversations. But yeah, yeah, but it's just like even if you just had those cases where. Um, you know, the the way the law was originally developed, um, there are cases that you might think are relevant to that law, but the way it was specified, um, don't decide whether it's, um, did you say protected or not protected or, or something else like that. And you know, that's something you can later decide by stipulation or some other procedure um, that wasn't just determined by the original law. Um, now, whether we call that, um, like using the same concept or deciding what the same concept is picking out or this sort of conceptual development or engineering is maybe a semantic question, I guess. I don't know. Well, there's likely a bit of sometimes it's it's conceptual engineering. Sometimes it's making a vague concept precise. Sometimes it's um, you know what what John Finnis would say, determinatio, making a, a more determinate decision within a range of acceptable decisions. Um, but sometimes it's getting it wrong, um, and 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 the fact that the court has the power to make the decision even when it makes the decision incorrectly. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair way to look at it. I want to think about it some more. Look, at, read into it more because it's not something I'm. Uh, uh, always, for. always room for a few more good people at the, at our law school. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and you mentioned, I think you mentioned John Finnis there, right? and, and um, there's another article um, where uh, you mentioned him actually in a footnote or somewhere. I, I mentioned him a lot. Yeah. Well, one other that I read anyway, <laughs> um, which was on um, Radbrook's formula. Gustav Radbrook. I'm not sure if that's pronounced Radbrook, right. Radbrook, yeah. Yeah, Radbrook. Gustav yeah. Radbrook. And uh, on, on in conceptual analysis. And um, and so from that, like uh, Rudbrook's basic idea was, uh, as I understood it, um, you know, in a way, legal facts aren't just facts about conventions. There can be flawed or incorrect laws, um, such as those which like support injustice or go against the aims, sort of constitutive of um, laws. Or I guess I don't, I'm not sure how to put it exactly, but. Um, Anyway, you talk about how this, you might interpret this or understand this as saying something about conceptual analysis or as making a sort of prescription recommendation for how to develop or change laws. Um, okay, so Gustav okay. Radbuch um, had a long career as a legal philosopher before World War II. Then 
uh, World War II came and, and he, he saw what the Nazis did. And he didn't live very long after World War II, but he, he lived long enough to, to write a couple of very influential short pieces. And basically what he said was that in general, courts should apply the law, even if it's a little bit unjust. But law, which is extremely unjust, and there were plenty of examples you know, from, from Nazi Germany, law, which was extremely unjust, um, loses its status of law and the court should not apply it. And there were examples in Rabuch Day from, from courts in the post-Nazi period. Um, and, and then more recently, after the unification of Germany, there were questions about applying East German law, the, former, the, the law of the former East Germany to East Germans, actions they did before unification. Importantly, in those cases, um, border guards who, who shot people who were trying to escape East Germany. And, and Rothbuch's statement was, you know, if it's, if it's too unjust, it loses the status of law and, and should not be applied. And, and Rothbuch's formula, as it's sometimes called, is, is occasionally um, put forward as a critique of legal positivism as a statement about the nature of law. So on its face, it's mostly or primarily a statement of how judges should decide cases. Um, and so the article you're, you're, you're talking about is, is uh, you know, my argument was that this should be understood at its face value as an argument about how judges in particular systems should decide particular sorts of cases rather than an argument about the nature of law. After all, to understand it as an argument about the nature of law is to say, that any legal system that did not adopt this particular strategy for judges is to that extent not a legal system or a faulty legal system. And I thought that that's a hard argument to make out. As much as I, you know, as much as one may be sympathetic to the to the to the prescription of the judges, look, if something's really unjust, don't apply it. I mean, Joseph Ross says. It's part of every judge's moral obligation as it is a part of every individual's moral obligation to do the right thing morally. Um, and if you're, in a judge, if you're a judge, to try to do justice. And sometimes doing the right thing morally or trying to do justice means you don't apply the statute or you lie about the statute. You do some other thing to make sure that you know, you're not complicit with extreme injustice. And so the argument of the article is it, it's clearest and best going forward to understand Rodbruch as a prescription for judges rather than as an argument about the nature of law. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like interpreting it that way anyway um, is definitely the more easily defensible, um, easy defensible thesis, I would say. I mean, what if we were to think about um, the, the laws as, like we have certain intentions for um, in developing laws um, that they, for one, that, that they abide by certain perhaps normative principles um, of justice, of like certain aims that we have for um, developing, employing and, and enforcing the laws and statutes that we um, develop. Um, and you might kind of build it in that like if some statute fails with respect to um, one of those um, aims or something like that, uh, you know, it, it should be considered illegitimate or flawed in some way. What if? Well, we have to figure out who the we in this sentence is. So look, if, if, if we make you dictator and we know you're a reasonable sort of person and, and, and one of the laws that you promulgate has absurd or unjust consequences, you say, well, that, that's clearly not what, what, what he intended. And, and we should interpret it in a way, you know, the, the, the good faith sort of way that he must have meant it. And, and we'll, you know, he just was having a bad day and we'll correct it. But of course, we know there are lots of leaders who aren't nice people, um, you know, the Stalins and Hitlers of the world or the Putins or whatever, right? And, and, you know, what, what happened in the Rodbrook situation is, is, you know, if you have Nazi judges applying Nazi law, nothing good is going to come of it. But every now and then you have a change in regime. 
right? Um, and, and, and a different set of judges are applying the law. And what should they be doing about it, right? So the, what you were just saying sort of is similar to what a, a theorist named Robert Alexi argued that, that all law, by the, as the nature of law makes a claim to correctness. And by that, what he means is moral correctness. And I've written pieces that are a bit skeptical about that. Um, but it's always open for a judge to say, look, this is a bad law, right? Um, and, and the question Rod Bruch asked both before and after World War II is how do we balance the need of law and judges to create certainty on one hand and the need and role of judges to create justice on the other hand. And, and what changed with Broadbrook is in before the war, he gave a lot more weight to legal certainty. And after the war, he said, at least where there's extreme injustice, legal certainty has to give way. Okay. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with saying, I'm a judge. I'm not going to be complicit with injustice. I'm going to find some above board or below board way to, to, to prevent extreme injustice. Um, I don't think you need to make a claim about the nature of law or the implicit claims of, uh, uh, of all legal systems uh, uh, to get to that place. Yeah, that's, that's fair, I guess. Um, and like I mentioned, you brought up uh, one of John Finnis's views in here, um, which I kind of liked. It's just this thought about um, laws as having this sort of double life one is that they're sort of, yeah. Yeah, the, the, it, fin, Finnis says the, the law has a double life. On one hand, um, you know, it, it, it's an institutional, you know, it's an institution, it has a history. Um, and on the other hand, it's, it's part of practical reasoning, right? It, it's, it's part of, of an integral part of how legal officials, judges and citizens decide what to do. And Finnis says, you know, if you, if you ask him, you know, are the worst of the Nazi rules law or not? He says, and, and Dworkin, by the way, says something similar. He says, well, it is and it isn't. It is in the sense that it was part of a system that looked more or less law-like and followed more or less law-like procedures. But it isn't in the sense that it's not law in the fullest sense. It does not give us moral reasons for action. It does not change the reasons for actions of either judges or citizens that to the extent they can avoid punishment, um, they should disregard it. Um, so, uh, you know, the you know, legal positivists tend to emphasize law as a certain types of social institution and natural law theorists tend to emphasize law as a type of practical reasoning and, and which one you focus on affects how you answer questions like this. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would say it's like, a, um, that these two senses are definitely not independent, right? There's this very tight connection between Sort of well, they're history. not independent yeah. in the sense that, um, to the extent that law gives you a reason for action, it's because it's a certain sort of social institution. It's not just, you know, out of thin air, as as, as Robert Covers says. You know, the you know the mere fact that you're an expert in constitutional law doesn't mean that any warden in jail is going to listen to you. Um, it ha you have to have been acting in the authority of the institution. Um, so they're connected, but they're still very different sort of uh, a foci. If you're focusing on how should I act, what's the right way to act, versus you know what do institutions like this do across uh, over the world and across time? Right, and there's a connection in the other direction too, right? That the way the institution is and like the way the history played out is a result or dependent on in various ways practical reason and the norms and so on that people are- Well, there's, prior, there's certainly with. practical reason within the institutions and how it operates. Um, right. And, and yeah, I mean, to you know, again, a point made by Robert Cover, to some extent, we develop the institutions the way we do, create sort of signals and rituals to try to increase the, the ability of, of the, you know, 
the actions of legal officials to affect the way individuals behave. Right, yeah. Um, okay, I don't know if I had anything else on that. Um, for now, I want to turn to one of your other papers on, um, I found kind of interesting looking at whether we can have kind of universal theories of contract law, but have also uh, perhaps other things and aspects of law. And um, so, yeah. yeah. And one of the, one of the things I, I work on is is contract law and, and and write about and comment on other people's theories of contract law, and and it's common, increasingly common in, in recent decades to have theories of doctrinal areas of law, theories of tort law, theories of property law, theories of contract law, and in the paper you're talking about, I just raise um, some skeptical questions that oftentimes these theories are put forward people who often you know very you know very conversant about the you know let's say the tort law or contract law of one or maybe two jurisdictions often in the united states and in the many states of the united states but not much beyond that and yet they put forward theories that by their language seem to be implying that this is a theory of contract law everywhere all the time for all time all current past present future and potential contract law systems or tort systems or property law systems and i just raised some questions that given you know there are there are similarities of uh, among you know many contract law systems you know the handful that i'm somewhat knowledgeable about um, but there are also significant differences, not to mention the fact that there are very few of us who, who, who are familiar with more than a handful of systems. And even the ones we're familiar with, there's usually only one or two that we actually know something about how it's practiced. Um, you know, in contract law, to some extent, another area I work in family law to a great extent, the laws that are on the statute books and the laws that are pronounced in the court decisions may be very different. From, from what you know how things are understood and in, in the day-to-day -day practice of, of, of lawyers and the individuals and the legal officials in the particular country and and to know law to that level in more than one jurisdiction let alone every jurisdiction uh, is very ambitious um so I I just on, on on one hand skeptical about the level of knowledge behind the theories but also just pointing out the, the levels of real world differences, especially at the level of details um, of rules, <coughs> rules and remedies from one jurisdiction to the next. Um, so I, I, I just, I'm just expressing some caution about what appear to be universal or general theories of, of particular areas of law. Yeah, that's a very good thing to be sensitive to, I think. I mean, it reminds me of something that's, um... I've discussed in some recent interviews in psychology and experimental philosophy, which is that look, a fair amount of studies um, uh, that are meant to have these like broad conclusions about human psychology are done on people in of specific um, like the weird people age and yeah, the weird people, Western educated, yeah. um, industrialized. Rich not, not, not to mention, you know, um, uh, affluent. Um, uh, college students and graduate right. students who, who may be a, a sub a subpopulation all their own. Yeah, like uh, I, I always like the fact that students in America, like you know. yeah, you know, the uh, one thing I always liked is 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 you, you may be familiar with the ultimatum game, where uh, one person is given a figure I don't know hundred dollars, and they say okay, there's a second person over there, you're going to offer them a, you know some portion of your hundred dollars. And if they accept it, um, you both get to keep it, uh, you know, whatever the division is. Um, and if they don't accept it, no one gets anything. And the economically rational thing to do is to offer the other person one penny. And the other person is supposed to say, oh, goodness, here's one penny I didn't have before. Thank you. Um, but, but in, you know, for most uh, experimental subjects, if you're not offering somewhere between 20 and 30%, They'll say no and say you're gonna if you're gonna give me that small amount, no one's gonna get anything. The only people for whom the one penny rule works are, are actual economics graduate students. 
So, you know, right. um, yeah, it, it, it depends who your subpopulation is. Right. But I was, I was thinking with respect to um, like theories of contract law and other things like of that variety, in a way it's even worse because um, if we wanted to not just, our general theory, not just to cover, you know, um, exist, like all existing things that we might call contract law, but anything past or future, right, that might, that might fall under that category. Um, like that's, that's like, you need a much stronger theory than that. Like it might, just knowing what people are doing at the, at the present might not be enough, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's not, it's not that you need to know the, the pred, you know, predispositions of future people. What you need at that point is an argument like Ernest Weinrib, who says, look, real tort law is corrective justice. That's what tort law is. So, uh, and, and, you know, and sometimes, and, and, and Charles Fried says, you know, contract law is essentially about promise. So what, what Weinrib says is if you have a tort system that deviates um, from corrective justice, he says it's not really tort law or not tort law in the proper sense. And when Charles Fried says, you know, admits there are elements to Anglo-American contract law that are not just about protecting promises, he says, well, yeah, you know, there, you know, there, there are other principles at stake. So you can sort of cheat. You can say that, you know, tort law is essentially corrective justice, contract law is essentially um, promise, and then you say anything that deviates from that is either not really tort law or not proper tort law, or you say it's additional elements, right? There are moral reasons for protecting reliance, and there's moral reasons for protecting other sorts of interests, and that's fine, but the core of contract law is promise, right? So you, you, you're not making a prediction about future behavior, what you're, you're just tying it to a particular moral principle and, and saying this is that, and anything that deviates, we're just gonna, you know, it's sort of like, you know, when the Rodbrook formula, if it deviates, then it's not law, right? If it deviates, it's not tort law, or, you know, it's some other aspect of contract principle. Yeah, so I guess, I, like, maybe there's sort of interplay between um, something descriptive, we're trying to find out, like, what people are doing when we talk about, like, the sort of things that we're currently calling contract law or something like that either in America or elsewhere. And also on some level, you're just going to end up maybe stipulating or declaring what it's, it's our concept never, is going to cover, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, we're not doing sociology here, right? We're not, we're not trying to uh, find a completely descriptive theory of, of all the slight differences of behavior. To some extent, it's always going to be a moral analysis and trying to find what is central or essential or key or foundational. But, you know, for that to be a useful enterprise, you still, there still has to be a descriptive element and say, and, and, you know, I see elements of this across the board, right? Otherwise it's just, you know, I have an interesting theory of Minnesota contract law in, in the year 2022, which is fine, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, most, you know, I not just the last couple of years wrote a review of a you know six hundred and some page book on on contract law theory. It wasn't meant to be just a a, a descriptive theory of of one jurisdiction's contract law. It was meant to be an ambitious claim about something central to the nature of contracts. And you know, a certain amount of deviation is understandable, but but the question is, are the differences so great between, let's say, jurisdictions? Um, that, that, that have judicial orders of specific performance as a matter of course and those who don't. Are those differences so great that there's something misleading about saying that, that they're you know, giving it all the same label? And th there's a concern, and I've written about this, you know, partly in this book, skeptic, you know, the article is skeptical about his, you know, universal theories, but also partly writings about Stuart Macaulay's work, is there's also concern of, of to what extent are we sort of misleading the public, right? If, if, if the view of contract law is some ideal where autonomy is protected and, and people, uh, you know, it's all about protecting autonomy and, re and respecting their voluntary decisions, while the real contract law that the, mass, the vast majority of people experience is um, 
you know, your employer or your wireless provider imposes terms and sign this or, or, or hit the road, um, you know, there's some concern about legitimation, some concern about mystification, that where, where the ideal of contract law that you learned from contract theory or first year contract law courses deviates too greatly from the experience of contract law most of us have. Yeah, but, um, part of the way I was thinking about it um, was that we can ask what, um, when we normally say somewhat pre-theoretically, maybe if you want to think about it that way, when we say contract law, I mean, we have a somewhat vague set of practices like evolving um, in different places in the world that we collectively call contract law and um by the way know. depends who the we is here i mean most yeah. people thought most people's most non-lawyer non-law student understandings of contract law like their understanding of employment law and marriage are wrong um and it's not just and it's not just that you're ignorant like i'm i'm ignorant of string theory and physics it's that they think they know and what they think they know is wrong People think, for example, they think that they can only be fired from their job for good cause, or they think that if the, if the other party breaches the contract, they'll get lots of damages. And most of the time, they're wrong. Yeah, I mean, I mean, really vaguely, though, I really like um, generally contract law is going to be laws, you know, governing the use and protection and enforcement of contracts and contracts are some sort of legal agreement. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I mean, people may not understand, you know, when, when are promises enforceable as opposed to, you know, contracts. The, the contracts, they think of some legal looking document with the word contract at the top. But, you know, when is a handshake deal enforceable? When is an oral promise enforceable? Um, likely they're wrong about many of those sorts of cases. Yeah. Um, Although there's going to be some like, there might be many cases where, um, like, we can stipulate precisely what we want to count as um, a contract or things covered by contract law, but um, in normal practice, absent that stipulation, it's just um, like that wasn't really something decided. It's just like we have this set of practices and laws and so on. Um, I mean, in some, in some jurisdictions, um, a, a seriously made promise is enforceable and other jurisdictions, it's not. Uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, lots of agreements need to be in writing and other jurisdictions, that's not the case. In some jurisdictions, if you have a writing, um, contrary or uh, oral promises can be admitted in other jurisdictions, no. In some jurisdictions, if, if a contract is breached, the court will order performance as a matter of course in other jurisdictions not. Um, there are a lot of differences. Yeah, but then the, the question is like whether, um, generally speaking, um, regulations governing um, uh, or protecting promises or something like that, is that, are those regulations part of contract law or is it not? Um, you know, it might be somewhat, uh, vague or unclear and if we want to develop the way i'm thinking about it anyway a precise definition of what counts as contract law okay then we can decide whether that counts or doesn't but like absent that yeah, i mean there, like, there there are things sort of you know adjacent right mm -hmm. uh there there are equitable rules that will enforce some promises even though they're not true contracts there are consumer protection laws that that may enforce certain advertisements even if the common law of contracts won't um, so yeah, there's, there's contract law and there's contract law adjacent. And I'm, I'm less concerned about the borderlines of you know, where contract law ends and something similar begins than I am concerned about the fact that the, the rules as to contract and the adjacent things vary a great deal from one jurisdiction to the next. Right. Um, I think though also in this paper, you're, you're, although you are kind of, um, critical of some of the attempts to provide general theories, you still think there's some use to 
um, at least attempting to providing some theories or um, about contract so law. I, because, as I yeah. said, I see it more as a corrective, right? I, I, I think that people are too quick and too casual to come forward with what appear to be general and universal theories. But I understand the motivation. There are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of structural and detailed similarities um, from one jurisdiction to the next. And in part, this is understandable. You know, the law is responding to the same sort of concerns. We want to enforce promises, agreements, exchanges. We want to give people, you know, grounds for reasonable reliance. We want to enforce a sort of commercial transactions on which, you know, our, our, our commercial system is, is based. Um, so the fact that there's a lot, there's a lot that's the same um, is worth noting. And you know, the reasons why you know, there's a convergent is worth noting. So again, it's, it's you know, I, I don't wanna to go too far to either extreme. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, all right, I think I want to wrap up in a couple of minutes if that's good with you. Okay. I do, I do normally end with a question on the, regarding like the value of philosophy. Um, $37 but, and 46 cents. <laughs> that's a good, I'll take it. No, um, yeah. I was, <laughs> but I, maybe more specifically on, on the value of uh, like legal philosophy to legal practice. Like what, what, what do you think the, what do you say some of the significance of this sort of philosophy is for, um, you know, le existing legal practice? I, I know it's a cliche, but I, I think that all philosophy has value in, especially, you know, in, in the teaching of philosophy has value in training people to think critically, to ask questions, to not take things for granted. Um, in legal philosophy, it's partly, you know, one part of it is that when I teach my students, they're law students, these are people who are gonna be out there in the world, this is what they're going to do for a living. And, and legal philosophy helps them make their life a reflective life is, you know, what am I doing? What's my place within the legal system? What's, my, what's the place of law within society, within justice and morality? You know, think about the value of, of law and the value of their place within law, but also um, it helps them to ask the sort of questions that they're going to need to ask for part of their legal practice. Um, as, as we're saying, a lot of law is unsettled. A lot of law is encouraging um, courts and administrators and legislators to change the law. And you change the law in part by having some view of what law should be doing and what it's not doing well enough. And to have you know, some critical perspective on, on the role of, of law in general and individual legal rules and individual areas of law. And hopefully legal philosophy helps to give that. I mean, part of what we do is we you know, teach feminist legal theory, critical race theory, law and economics, law and literature, bring a variety of perspectives and, and a variety of critical perspectives um, to the law. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great outlook. Um, yeah, so uh, this has been pretty informative to me, hopefully to others as well, but- uh, Well, I, I enjoyed it. I, I appreciate your taking the time and, you know, Lots of better things we could all be doing. I, I appreciate your taking the time to talk to me.